Hey, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 9. And the title of the message today is Answering Difficult Questions That Nonbelievers Ask. Shortly after I became a Christian, I had the opportunity to pray with someone to accept Christ. This came as a great shock to me. I've told you the story before. I was only a couple of weeks old, maybe three weeks old in my faith, and I went out on the beach in Newport, armed with a copy of the Four Spiritual Laws, and basically read it verbatim to some lady there, and she prayed and accepted the Lord. And I was feeling, hey, I'm pretty good. You know, Billy Graham, move over. There's a new kid in town, and, and I was full of zeal and excitement and wanted to reach lost people. Well, anyway, I had a bunch of buddies I used to hang around with before I was a Christian, and after I accepted the Lord, I remember telling them, guys, don't worry about me. I'm not gonna go off the deep end. I know you've seen other people become Jesus freaks, and they carry Bibles around and say stuff like, praise the Lord. That will never happen to Greg Laurie. I said, you will never hear me say, praise the Lord. I will never publicly carry a Bible or wear like a cross around my neck. I'm not gonna be that way. So a few weeks go by and after I'd led this lady to the Lord, I'm walking down the street and who comes walking toward me but one of my old friends, also named Greg. Greg and I spent a lot of years in elementary school together. We knew each other very well. He looked at me and I looked at him and we both broke out laughing. Why? Because in my hand was a Bible in public. Hanging around my neck was a cross, a little bit too big, I might add. And before I could catch myself, I said, praise the Lord. Th that's why we laughed. And I said, Greg, I know this is so crazy. Here I am, you've known me all these years and, and now here I am doing this, but, but I have to tell you that God has really changed my life. And so we started a conversation and I began to share with Greg some of the things that the Lord had been doing in me and, and how things that had changed for me. And, and there's this guy who was eavesdropping on our conversation. I, I didn't even really notice him, but he walks right in, interrupts me, and turns to me and says, hey Christian, I have a few questions for you. I look at him like, I've known the Lord for four weeks, fire away. And he hit me with like four or five questions. I don't even recall what they were now. All I know is I was dumbfounded. Where's Dinesh D'Souza when you need him? And he was great last week too, wasn't he, by the way? Really, really good. Appreciate Dinesh. Well, Dinesh was not there, nor was Ravi Zacharias or Josh McDowell or, or anybody else with answers that I needed. I was dumbfounded and I thought I need to start getting ready for this kind of thing because I need to know what answers are to questions that people ask. Now I don't claim to have all the answers uh, but I believe that there are answers for many of the questions that people will bring before us. And we pointed out to you that as Christians we are to give an answer to every man who asks us according to 1 Peter 3.15 and you remember that phrase giving to every man an answer is from the Greek word apologia where we get our English word apologetic. It means a legal defense is in a court of law. So it's sort of like you're making your case in the courtroom a public opinion with a person who is listening to you. But keep this in mind. In this courtroom so called you are not there as a prosecuting attorney but a witness. See, a prosecuting attorney is gonna win. He might even be wrong, but he's still going to win. A witness just says what they've seen. And sometimes I've seen Christians armed with all the information they can get assault non-believers and effectively blow them out of the water. Yeah, I'd smoke that person. Yeah, they don't ever wanna hear about this again. You won the argument, but you lost the soul. And that's not the objective. When we go to a person, even though we may know a great deal more than they know, we should present this information with love and grace and humility. In fact, we're told in 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone and gently teach those that oppose the truth so God will change their hearts and they'll believe the truth and they'll come to their senses. Okay. So when you're out telling others about Christ, you will often be barraged with questions. Now 
sometimes people ask questions they actually want the answers to. And when you give them the answer, they'll say, that really cleared that up for me. Thank you so much. But a lot of times these questions are like a smoke screen. They are there to get you off track. Basically they are there to get you to shut up and go away. And we saw the example with Jesus and the woman at the well as he engaged her and began to speak to her heart. She tried to get him off on a secondary issue about the technical place where God ought to be worshiped. And he gave a basic answer to that and brought her back into the thing that really mattered. So when we're dealing with these questions, it's important to address what we are being asked. But remember, our core message to the non-believer is the gospel. So what are those questions? Well, I wish I could deal with all the questions we hear. We dealt with some of them last week with Dinesh. But here are the questions we'll deal with in our short time that we have together. Number one, how do you know the Bible is the Word of God? You'll mention Scripture and people will say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. I think it was written by men. In fact, it's full of contradictions. I always love to ask them to show me one or two and rarely can they even come up with a half-hearted attempt to bring any contradiction from the Bible so-called. They just say that. Number two, people will say, how can a God of love send people to hell? You say you believe that there's a hell. How could a loving God send someone there? You might also get asked, what about the person who has never heard the gospel? Will God send them to hell? And then the question you hear probably more often than any other, if God is all good and God is all loving, why does he allow tragedy, injustice, uh, all the problems of life? So let's take a shot at some of these questions. Let's start with the one about the Word of God. How do you know the Bible is the Word of God? How many of you brought a Bible with you today? Why don't you grab it and just hold it up right now. This book, this book you're holding in your hand is the most amazing book ever written. Please put it down, that's it. That, that's long enough. This guy, that was way too long. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's the most amazing book ever written. It is literally God's message to us. Technically speaking, the Bible is not one book, but it's 66 books written over a 1,500 year span from 40 authors, each inspired by the Holy Spirit, coming from every walk of life, including kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, and scholars. Yet. They have one theme that, that reverberates from Genesis to Revelation, and that is the redemption of mankind. And every one of these men was directed, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words. And we say that, but how can we know the Bible really is true? Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, I know the Bible is true because it gave me the experience it claimed it would give me. I repeat, I know the Bible is true because it gave me the experience it claimed it would give me. Now that's not the only reason I believe it and perhaps it's not even the most convincing reason to the skeptic, but it has certainly helped me to personally believe. Isn't that true for you? I know it's true because it all happened for me. For instance, I read in the Bible that if I would confess my sin, God would forgive me my sin and remove my guilt. Well, I confessed my sin and guess what? My guilt was removed. The Bible promised that I would have a peace that passes all human understanding and I have experienced that time and time again. The Bible promised that God would answer my prayers and I have prayed about certain things and I have seen God faithfully answer over all these years. The Bible promised that God would never give me more that I could handle. And I've gone through hardships in life and have found God's word to be true. And it has sustained me. In fact, it has sustained me through the worst crisis of my life to date. And that is the death of my son. Yesterday marked the two year anniversary of the day he left us for heaven. It was a very hard day for us. And you know, at this point in time, uh, people don't come up as often and, and say things, you know, that they, they probably feel like it's been said and, and maybe they're over it. And, and well, listen, you know, just on behalf of all people who are grieving, 
who have lost a loved one, especially a child. We, we aren't over it, and frankly, we'll never get over it. In fact, in fact, do us a favor and don't ever ask us if we're over it. it. You don't get over something like that, but you do get through it day by day. And I've gotten through it day by day because of God's Spirit sustaining me through the Scripture, reading the Scripture, trusting the Word of God. My emotions don't always cooperate. So I have to apply my mind and heart to believe what the Bible says. And there are times when I kind of feel it. There are a lot of times when I'm not feeling it. But I have found God's word to be true. C.S. Lewis put it this way, quote, you never really know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life or death to you, end quote. That was in this book, A Grief Observed, that he wrote in the aftermath of his wife's death. Yeah, that's true. You can say, oh, I believe this, but what about when it happens to you? Oh, I believe that my loved one is in heaven. We'll even say that. Someone dies, well, they're in heaven. Well, yeah, we know that, but when that loved one was with you yesterday and they're not with you today and someone says, well, they're in heaven, it's like, yeah, we know, but you know what? We miss them, okay? But then even when you yourself are thinking about it, yeah, I know they're in heaven, but do I really believe they're in heaven? Do I actually believe they're there? And do I really believe I will see them again? The answer is, yes, I do, and yes, I will. I have found the word of God to be true. God has kept his promises to me. But that's not the only reason I believe the Bible is true. The Bible is true because it's confirmed by science. And we touched on this a little bit when Dinesh joined us and how science and the Bible sometimes conflict, but often they are in harmony. For instance, it is the Bible that said first, long before science figured it out, that the stars in the heavens are beyond counting. We read in Isaiah 51 that God stretched forth the heavens into limitless expanse which can never be measured and filled it with stars which are as numerous as the sands upon the seashore. And for years, uh, astronomers, scientists, and so forth mock the Bible. The Bible says there's more stars than, than you can count. It's like the sand on the shore. How absurd. You can count the stars. Well, look. One, two, three. Then they invented the first telescope. Okay, well, maybe there's a few more than we thought. 300, 400, 500. Then a more powerful telescope. Well, okay, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And then even more powerful telescopes come along, and now... Science and astronomy agree that you literally cannot count the stars in all of the galaxies that are out there. And they've actually said they are as numerous as the sands on the shore. In fact, estimates range of the number of stars out there today from 200 billion to 70 sextillion. 70 sextillion is 70 million, million, million. Some of you are still thinking 70 sextillion? A few, a few guys woke up. Did you say sex? No, it's okay. I'm not talking <laughs> sextillion. Relax. The Bible said this, that the stars were beyond counting. It was the Bible that said that the things that we see are made up of things that cannot be seen. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command and what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. What a weird statement. What do you mean it comes from something that can't be seen? I can see this microphone stand or this monitor here. No, it's made up of other things. Oh, now we know everything is made up from protons, neutrons, and electrons. That which we see is made up by that which we do not see. The Bible said that way before anybody else figured it out. I could go on. But let me point out something that is very important. It's not the intention of the Bible to be a textbook on science per se. If it were, it would be much thicker than it is and much less comprehensible. When the Bible addresses scientific or historical fact, it is always accurate, but the Bible is primarily intended to be a book of redemption. Its primary purpose is not to tell us how the heavens go, but rather to tell us how to go to heaven. So the Bible may address a scientific issue, it may address a historical issue, but the objective of the Bible is not to be a science textbook or a historical book 
as its main goal. The objective of Scripture is to reveal God to us, but when it refers to those things, it is always accurate and it's always trustworthy. Bringing me to the third reason why I believe the Bible is the Word of God, because it's confirmed by archeology. span it's confirmed by archaeology. Over the years, countless critics have challenged the teachings of the Bible, but recent archaeological findings confirm time and time again the Bible was and is reliable. For years, people disputed the biblical account of crucifixion. Oh, well, there's no historical evidence of crucifixion. We don't have any archaeological uh, proof that a crucifixion ever took place. And you can see how a statement like that strikes at the very heart of the Christian faith because we talk so often about the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross. But this criticism was silenced in 1968 when the remains of a crucified man in his mid-30s were discovered north of Jerusalem with a seven inch iron nail still embedded in the heel. The state of his bones indicated the condemned man's were outstretched, his feet had been placed sideways, and the nail driven through a small block of wood, and then through both heels, and then into the cross. Once again, the Bible said it before the so-called experts had it. Critics have come over the years saying, well, we don't believe the Bible is true because it speaks in detail about a Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. But there is no historical and or archeological evidence to confirm that a man named Pontius Pilate ever lived. That is, until 1961, when they found what is now known as the Pilate Stone uh, in Caesarea, confirming that Pontius Pilate indeed existed and dedicated an amphitheater in the memory of Caesar himself. Critics also opine, oh, the Bible can't be true because it talks about Caiaphas, the high priest, and there is no archeological and or historical evidence for a man named Caiaphas ever existing. That is until 1990 when they found the tomb of the high priest Caiaphas. Jewish historian Nelson Gluick made this statement and I quote, it may be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail the historical statements made in the Bible, end quote. Number four, I believe the Bible is true because it is the one book that dares to predict the future. Not once, not twice, but hundreds of times. With 2020 hindsight, we have all of the prophecies that spoke of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, among other things. And we can look back and realize that those prophecies were fulfilled exactly. But then, of course, the Bible speaks of our future. It was the Bible that told us that the Jewish people would be there in their land and they would be dispersed to the four corners of the earth. It was the Bible that told us they would regather again together in their land and would be isolated from the other nations of the world. It was the Bible that tells us that Jerusalem would be at the center of world conflict in the end times. And folks, we're seeing this happen before our very eyes. I mean, what are the the possibilities that this could all be coincidental. Uh, think of all the uh, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. A scientist figured out the odds of just eight prophecies of Jesus being fulfilled by mere coincidence. He said the chance that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem one in 280,000. The chance that he would have been the, have a forerunner announcing his coming one in a thousand. The chance that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, one in 10,000. The chances he would have his hands wounded, one in 10,000. The chance that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, one in 1,000. Put it all together. What are the chances that Jesus did these things coincidentally? He said one in 10 to the 28th power. That's almost as crazy as sextillion. It, to illustrate, he put it this way. He said, if you were to cover the entire state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep, then mark one and randomly throw it out there and blindfold someone and have them walk across the state of Texas, the chances of them reaching down and picking up the marked silver dollar are the same chances that Jesus could have had these things happen coincidentally. That's only eight of the prophecies. There were many, many more. Yes, the Bible is the book you can trust. 
I heard a story about a girl who was uh, out sharing her faith one day and a little crowd had gathered around her and an atheist was eavesdropping, thought he would humiliate this young girl and with his big booming voice said, young lady, you believe uh, the Bible? She said, well, yes, sir, I do. Well, I have a question for you then if you believe the Bible. She said, okay. Do you believe all the miracles in the Bible? She said, yes, I do. Oh, you do? Then you must believe in the story of Jonah and the whale. And a man was swallowed by a whale and then lived for three days and was spit out by the whale. You believe that? She said, yeah, I believe it. It's in the Bible. Now, how, how did that happen? How could such an event actually take place? It's impossible. She says, I have no idea. When I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. The atheist said, well, what if he's not in heaven? She said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> How many of you have heard that story before? Raise every hand. Thank you for that courtesy laugh. <laughs> right when I started the story, you leaned over and you said, he's gonna do that lame story again. <laughs> Just laugh, it makes him happy. <laughs> he's getting old now. Okay, what about this one? How could a God of love send someone to hell? If your God is all loving, the person will say, how could he send a person to a place as horrible as hell? Now, by the way, I will try to engage a person in dialogue when they say things like this. Instead of saying, well, uh, well that's an interesting question you asked there. Do you believe there's a hell? Well, yes, I do. And who do you think would go there? Well, no, I don't. Whatever they say, I'll engage them. Why do you bring that up? And, and then it's interesting that you say, oh, why would God send a person? So you know there's a God. You believe there's a hell. I'll try to draw them out. A lot of times, frankly, these are things that people say because they've heard other people say them. They parrot this information. And when you actually respond with a logical uh, argument, they back away. Well, what about that? How could a God of love send someone to hell? Well, the simple answer is God doesn't send anyone to hell. We effectively send ourselves there. That is not a cop-out. That is an accurate statement. Because hell was not created for people. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. That's what Jesus said. And God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants all mankind to believe in him and go to heaven. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he sent his son to be crucified on a cross and murdered in cold blood. And the Bible says if we neglect this sacrifice of Jesus and his offer of forgiveness... How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So no one is gonna be accidentally in hell, nor will anyone be accidentally in heaven. People will be in heaven and in hell because of a deliberate choice, the result of a choice they make. C.S. Lewis said, quote, no one goes to heaven deservingly and no one goes to hell unwillingly, end quote. Timothy Keller made this statement about hell, quote, people only get in the afterlife what they most wanted, either to have God as Savior and Master or to be their own saviors and masters. Hell is simply one's freely chosen path going on forever. He wanted to get away from God and God in his infinite justice sends us where we wanted to go. Yeah, a person will say, but what about the person who has never heard the gospel? Will a God of love send them to hell? Here's the short answer to that. God will judge us according to the light we have received. In other words, God will not hold you responsible for something you have never heard before. Well, what does that mean? That means that you'll be held accountable for what you know. And everybody knows something. Now, some know a lot more than others. Some have sat through entire messages where the gospel was presented. They'll be held accountable for what they've heard. Uh, others have not heard the gospel. There are people out there today who have never had someone tell them about Jesus Christ. So are they off the hook? Is ignorance bliss? Not at all. They will be judged as well. According to what? Well, here's what Romans 1 tells us. And let me read it to you. And this is from the New Living Translation that is quite helpful in this particular passage. 
It says, God chose his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who push the truth away from themselves. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky and all that God made. They can see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. So what this is saying is they have the testimony of nature. No, nature does not present the gospel of Jesus Christ, but nature declares the existence of a creator God. And only a fool would ignore that. You look around, you go, there is a God. Plus there is an internal compass. We instinctively know what is right and wrong. People say, well, no, I don't. I have my own rules. I live by my own standards and I believe the good Lord of the man upstairs or whatever they call him will judge me according to the standards that I have set in my life that I live by. Here's the problem, Buckaroo. You don't even live by your own standards and you know it. You break your own rules all the time. Well, that's why I keep writing new rules. Yeah, and lowering the bar all the time. See, you instinctively know what is right and wrong. Even a little child knows that. Watch a child when they're misbehaving. They know. My little granddaughter Lucy, she's so little. She's just learning how to walk, but she knows when she's going to do something bad because she'll, just before she does it, she looks over like that. <laughs> we have that internal compass inside of us. Paul writes in two, Romans 2.12, God will punish sin wherever it's found. He'll punish the non-believer when they sin, even though they never had God's written laws. For listen, down in their hearts they know right from wrong. God's laws are written within them. Their own conscience accuses them. You see? So they know instinctively right from wrong. They've broken that, not to mention that they've broken the commandments of God. Here's what it comes down to. If a person is a true seeker of truth, the Lord will reveal himself to them. I believe that. I think there's a lot of people that say they're seeking truth, but they aren't. Because if they were really seeking truth, they would find their way to Jesus Christ. So you find someone that's in a cult or in some weird, you know, homemade version of what they think religion ought to be, a little New Age mysticism thrown in with a, a little Christianity and a little Buddhism, a little of this, a little of that. And, and they say, well, no, the, this is my truth. And, you know, what they've done is they don't want to change their lifestyle, so they found a religion that suits them. Okay, that's the bottom line. Jesus said people don't come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds exposed. So they can give you all these reasons. I'm gonna tell you the real reason. The reason is they don't wanna change so they come up with some gobbledygook to believe in so they'll feel better about themselves. But if they're a true seeker of truth, if they really wanna know God, God re will reveal himself to them. Because the Lord himself says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you'll seek me and find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, I will be found by you. The Bible tells the story of a man named Cornelius, a Roman centurion. Uh, this was a man who was powerful, had great responsibility, uh, an intelligent man to rise to such a rank. Yet, unlike most of his fellow Romans, he did not worship the false gods that they had adopted from the Greeks. Nor did he worship Caesar himself, as was the custom of that day. Cornelius, to the best of his understanding, believed in the God of the Jews. This was the land they were occupying. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though he was a Gentile, he believed in the God of the Hebrews. He wanted to know God deep down in his heart and he prayed to the God he knew. And guess what? God heard his prayer and sent Simon Peter to personally deliver the gospel to him. And when Cornelius heard it, he believed right on the spot. If a person really wants to know God, the Lord will reveal, will reveal himself to them. Okay, let's come to our last question and this will use the remainder of our time up. I wish I had more time to deal with it. It's such a vast important topic. How could a God of love allow suffering? People will ask. Why is there sickness, even death, tragedy, and so forth? Okay, for the answer, let's look at John 9. And we're going to read verses 1 to 7. Here's a story of a man who was healed. 
Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, he spit on the ground, made clay with the saliva, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he washed and came back seeing. This is a crazy story. Here's a guy who's blind. Jesus heals him. How does he heal him? He spits in the dirt. I love the fact that Jesus never healed any two people in exactly the same way. One person, he touches them. Another person, they touch him. To another, he speaks the word. Another touches the hem of his garment. This guy, he spits in the dirt. Can you imagine coming up and asking for prayer from the pastors? Pray for me, sure, no problem. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. Maybe the Lord varied his methodology because he knew how prone we are to get hung up on things. We'd form a whole denomination around it. No, Jesus mixed it up so we would just remember it's God that does the healing. It's not a certain technique or a certain this or a certain that. So, but here's the question that is asked. Whose sin, ask his disciples, this man or his parents? This really comes back to the essential question. Why does God allow suffering? How come this guy is blind? Why did this disability take place? Who's at fault? Is it his own fault? Did it come as a punishment to him for something bad he had done? Or was it his parents' fault? And thus the Lord judged them through their child. Jesus is saying, oh stop. It's nobody's fault. This man didn't sin. His parents didn't sin. And we want to always blame sin or the repercussions of the hardships of life on God. You know, the problem of pain, writes C.S. Lewis, is atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith. And it's true. Because life is filled with injustices. Things happen that just don't make sense. And sometimes people turn away from God because of this, because a tragedy in life. You know, their parents divorced, or a parent dies, or a sibling dies, or, or they get cancer, or somebody close to them has something horrible happen, and they say, I can't believe in a God like that, and they turn away from God. Or we look at tragedies that we all witness, like a, the latest earthquake here, or a, a tsunami that just hit there, or a typhoon, or or the World Trade Center is attacked and those towers come crashing to the ground with such a horrible loss of life, or a plane crashes, or a train goes off the rails, or a friend of ours who's a Christian gets cancer, or a child is born with a disability, or a young man is killed in an automobile accident, and we wonder why. You see, because our human intellects and notions of fairness reject the apparent contradiction between a loving God and a world of pain. It just doesn't make sense to us. And then sometimes it seems wrong because there'll be the drunk driver, you know, coming home from the bar that has a collision with the family of four on their way to church and the Christian family dies and the drunk driver doesn't even get injured. Okay, now there are times when there is cause and effect. There are times when someone does something wicked and they reap the repercussions. They go rob a bank, they get arrested, they go to prison, oh you see, you reap what you sow. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of times things make sense, but then there are times when things don't make sense at all. Then what, what do we do? The way we see it, God is all good, but he's not all powerful. Therefore, he can't stop evil. Or maybe God is all powerful, but he isn't all good. Therefore, he doesn't stop evil. Here's the answer. You may like it or not like it, but it's the answer. Jesus is saying, neither this man nor his parents sin. 
Meaning, in this particular instance, there is no correlation between his condition and sin. Jesus is saying bad things happen and they're inexplicable. All disability, all sickness, all pain, even death itself, are the result of sin. Now, when I say that, I don't mean because of sin a person committed. I mean because of sin in general. Sin has polluted the human race. Because our first parents ate of the forbidden fruit. Sin entered the human race. Romans 5.12 says it says it came into the world through one man and death spread to all men because all men have sinned. And so now because of the effects of sin we don't live forever. We weren't supposed to get old. We weren't supposed to lose our memories. What was I just saying? No. We, <laughs> we weren't supposed to have disease or illness and we certainly weren't supposed to die. But sin has entered into this world and God gave to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and to us a free will. But we ask, why do these things happen? You know, after the World Trade Center was attacked, I remember that a lot of people were asking why, of course. Some preachers said, well, this is the judgment of God on America. You may remember that I was not one of those preachers that said that because I heartily disagreed with that statement. Because to me it had all kinds of problems theologically. For starters, if that was God's judgment on America, why was that God's only judgment on America? And if it was His judgment, why there? Is that really the, the one place that God would judge us there at the World Trade Center? Listen, there were Christians in the Twin Towers too. So what's with that? I'll tell you what's with that. That was not God's judgment against America. That was a sinful act done by wicked Islamic terrorists in the name of their false god. They were wicked and did it for wicked reasons. God allowed it. We don't know why. But bad things happen. Earthquakes happen. Tragedies happen. Murders happen. Why? I don't know. But one day some people came to Jesus and they asked him about a tower that fell. Apparently this was an event that was known by many. It fell on a group of Gentiles. This tower tipped over fell and killed a bunch of people. And so they asked the question, were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? In other words, Lord, did that tower fall on them because they were worse sinners and everybody else? And I love the answer of Christ. He said, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will perish. So in other words, they were saying, Lord, is it because these guys were so horrible this happened? Jesus is saying, no, people die, period. And you better be careful because you might die too. That's it. Well, what? people die. We could be driving home today and die. You could have a heart attack today. You could find a lump in your breast and it's diagnosed as cancer and you only have a short time to live. You could slip in your shower at home and hit your head and die. Greg, this is like the most depressing message I've ever heard. I know, I know. Okay, but I'm dealing with the topic here, all right? Everybody dies. There are no exceptions. That doesn't mean that God is unfair. It doesn't mean it was judgment. It just means it was time for that person to leave this earth and it will come to everyone. Some die young, some die old. Some die slowly, others die quickly. But everyone dies. Here's the point Jesus was making. You don't know when it's gonna happen, so be ready to go. But why does God allow suffering? Well, I can't give you an answer that will probably satisfy you because if I could, I would. And I've searched myself for answers to that question. And there are times we can say, well, this good thing came out of that thing and I can see how the Lord's using it. And frankly, there are times when we say, I don't get this at all. This really doesn't seem good, but I'm trusting God in His Word and that in the end, all things will make sense and work together for good to those that love God. But here's some things to consider as we close. God may allow suffering and sickness to get our attention. He may allow suffering and sickness to get our attention. You know, when everything's going well in life, a lot of times we just don't really think we need God now, do we? A lot of times crisis is the wake-up call. 
Something traumatic, something big, something earth-shaking wakes us up to our need for God. As the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted I went astray, but now I have kept your word. So it might be something like that that wakes you up. Sometimes God will use the worst to accomplish the best. But then there are times when these things happen we don't get it. We just have to trust the Lord. People will say, well, when I get to heaven I have a lot of questions to ask God. I understand that. But I suggest to you when you get to heaven you'll take one look in His holy face and say, never mind. <laughs> and that day you will know as you are known. Maybe not until. Certainly not until. You might know some, but not all. Number two, suffering helps us grow spiritually and makes us stronger in our faith. You know, sometimes people will say, well, through this crisis, I lost my faith. Respectfully, may I say, maybe you never had faith. Because if your faith is real, it will not be destroyed through crisis. It will only get stronger. And if your faith cannot withstand crisis, then it's not genuine faith at all. So when people say they lost their faith, I suggest maybe they never had faith in the living God, but it's never too late to get some. But this will strengthen you. The thing you fear the most could be the best thing for you in your spiritual life, believe it or not. James 1, 2 says, when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't treat them as intruders, but as friends. Realize that they have come to test your faith and produce in you a quality of endurance. And let that process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you'll find you become men and women of mature character, men and women of integrity with no weak spots. Third, suffering can bring glory to God. It can bring glory to God. How? Well, sometimes when God removes it. That's what happened with the blind man. Hey, who sinned? This man or his parents said he was born blind. Hey, no one sinned. But in order that... The works of God might be put on display. He heals the guy. So Jesus said, look, don't worry about how this happened. Just watch what I'll do. And there are times crisis hits and we call on God and God comes through and crisis goes away. It happens. You know, you get that bad news from the doctor. You pray and you go back in for a test and whatever it was that was bothering them isn't there anymore. We can't believe this. We've never seen anything like this before. You have that situation where there's no way you'll ever have the resources to pay these bills and boom, you have the resources. You have this other problem, there's no way it will ever be fixed and boom, it's fixed. God comes through and you say, look at what my God did. And people say, wow, that's a powerful God you're serving. But then there are times when you pray and the dead person isn't raised, the sight isn't restored, the the crisis isn't averted. In fact, it even gets worse. Well, then what? Then you can glorify the Lord through your suffering. And understand something. That is a powerful witness to a lost world. See, anybody can be happy when the sky is blue and the sun is shining. See, people look at us as Christians and say, you know, you're, you're all so weird, you Christians. Your little smiling Christian faces. And you get in your little Christian cars and drive to your Christian church and go out and eat your Christian food and praise the Lord this and hallelujah that. You guys don't live in the real world. Then one day, crisis hits that little Christian family. And they're still going to church and they're still praising the Lord. And the non believer says, huh, maybe there's something to it. Yeah, there is. God can be glorified in our suffering. A good example of this is Paul and Silas. They were thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. And they were whipped and put into a dungeon. Wasn't like the cell Lindsay Lohan is in right now. <laughs> Where when she comes out of her cell, everybody's put in lockdown. All the other prisoners are upset. And I'm, you know what? I hope Lindsay Lohan comes to put her faith in Jesus Christ because that's what she needs to get out of the <laughs> mess she's in. I hope she doesn't end up as another one of these Hollywood statistics of young girls, young boys who 
get even worse through a drug, you know, end up in a drug overdose or whatever it is. Just pray the Lord saves her soul and maybe God will use these circumstances. But here's Paul and Silas. They're in a hell hole. They're in a dungeon. They're in pain. But I love how in the book of Acts it says, but at midnight Paul and Silas sang praises to God. So Silas, what do you want to do? How about a little two-part harmony? Let's go. Ba -bum, ba -dum, bum bum And they start worshiping God. What? The other prisoners, the Bible says, Listen, and that word listen can be translated listened with pleasure. Have you ever heard something you liked? Maybe a song on the radio. Oh, I like that song, turn it up. Yeah, that's my song. That's how the people were listening. They'd never heard singing in a dungeon before. Then an earthquake comes and the walls collapse and the jailer who's in charge of all of this and had actually whipped Paul and Silas was ready to kill himself because the penalty in those days was if you lost your prisoners you'd be put to death. He's just ready to thrust the sword into his chest and Paul and Silas says, wait, 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 don't do it. We're all here still. And this guy says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, hey, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that man believes and he takes Paul and Silas home, gives them a nice meal, cleans their backs up. His whole family comes to faith. Why? Because they had earned the right to share the gospel with him by rejoicing in time of calamity. And when you worship God through hardships in life, it will give you a platform to reach people in a different way. Yes, God can use these things to bring glory to his name. And fourth and lastly, your suffering will not last forever. I know like, like it seems it will, but it won't. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, Our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather we look forward to what we have not yet seen for the troubles we see now will soon be over but the joys to come will last forever. Maybe tragedy has recently knocked at your door. You've had a close brush with death or a friend or a loved one has died or you're very sick right now or you're just getting old and you know the clock is ticking. The fact is the pain and the joys of this life are all temporal. But eternity, well that lasts forever. And Jesus Christ suffered and died on a cross so you could live forever. Maybe you've come here today with some of the questions that I've raised and I hope that I've been able to answer them in some way, shape, or form. You probably have other questions. That's okay. But you know what? When you become a Christian, you take that step of faith and you believe. And there might be some of you here that have never asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin. You don't have that assurance that when you die, you will go to heaven. But you want it. Maybe you're going through a hardship right now and you want God's help. You come to Christ and believe in Him and He will forgive you of every sin you have ever forgiven. The Bible promises this. You'll find this to be true for yourself. But you need to say, Lord, come into my life. And as we close now in prayer, if you've never asked Christ to come into your heart and life to be your Savior and Lord, do it now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us now. And now I pray for any here that may not yet know you. They're still living in sin, plagued by guilt, terribly afraid of dying, lonely, empty, scared. Lord, would you help them to see their need for you and help them to come to you right now, we pray. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, if you want Jesus Christ to come and live in your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, if you want your guilt taken away, I want you to stand to your feet right now and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. God bless you. Just stand up. Stand to your feet and stay standing if you would. God bless you. Yeah, good. Stand. Up there in the balcony. Stand to your feet. If you want Christ to come into your life today, God bless you over there on this side. God bless you in the back. Up in the balcony. God bless all of you that are standing. Know that you're not alone if you're standing right now. Don't worry about that. Just stand up. Don't be embarrassed. You're among friends and family here today, okay? 
You want Christ to come into your life. Stand to your feet. If you're outside in the amphitheater, you stand up. I can't see you, but it really doesn't matter if I see you. This is between you and God. If you're up in the court building watching the big video screen, stand to your feet right now. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of asking Christ to come into your life. Just stand up wherever you are. This final moment, if you haven't stood yet, stand now if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life. And I'll lead you in this prayer. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand up. God bless you, sir. Up there in the balcony in the corner. God bless you. Anybody else? This final moment. Stand up to your feet. God bless you and you. Anybody else? Stand up. God bless you. God bless you. All right, all of you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. This is where you're asking Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sin. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me, if you would, please. Pray this now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin right now. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my God. And be my friend. I choose to follow you now, Jesus, from this moment forward. Thank you for accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless each one of you that stood and prayed that prayer. God bless you guys. Amen. Praise God.